Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So our global chair will give a brief welcome. Martha. Thank you so very much, uh, Betsy, and thank you for your leadership of the Global Senior Caucus. My name is Martha McDavid-Pugh. I am a California voter living in the Netherlands, and I'm the Global Chair, International Chair of Democrats Abroad. And I want to thank everyone for attending this special event today about an important issue, which is access to Social Security for Americans who live abroad. As the official Democratic Party arm for the millions of Americans who live outside the United States, Democrats Abroad is advocating for policies that improve the lives of Americans living abroad, and that's really a part of our mission, alongside mobilizing Americans voting, living abroad to vote. And that advocacy and that voting go hand in hand. It's only by winning elections that we create the opportunity for the policies and the laws that support the world of fairness and equity that we all want to see. Democrats Abroad has members in nearly every country in the world, and we're organized in 48 country committees and 12 global caucuses throughout Europe, the Americas, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. And our country committees help members participate in the US political process. While our global caucuses and task forces focus on mobilizing voters and addressing specific issues such as voting rights, equality, healthcare, taxation, social security, and many more. And our members are voting in every state and every congressional district across the United States. Democrats Abroad is represented on the Democratic National Committee with eight voting members, as well as at the Democratic National Convention, which is going to take place this August. And at our own regional and global conventions, we're going to be electing the delegates to the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, as well as our DNC members. And we really encourage all of our members to participate. And you're all welcome to join us in Costa Rica for our unique in-person global convention at the end of May and June. And the information is available on our website. We'll put that link in the chat, democratsabroad.org for the 2024 convention. Uh, so a little bit about Democrats Abroad. We're a volunteer run organization and we're able to mobilize voters thanks to generous donations of American citizens like yourselves. And we welcome you to support our work by donating to democratsabroad.org slash donate. Now, Social Security is an important issue, and that's why we're so grateful that you're here today to learn more and tackle the issue of access to benefits that many of us have worked for and earned. And I hope today's session is helpful, and I welcome you all. Thank you so much, Martha. And good morning, afternoon, and evening to those joining globally. Uh -huh. My name is Betsy Torrey. I serve as the chair of our Democrats Abroad Global Senior Caucus, and I invite you, if you can, to share in the chat where you vote and where you're tuning from. Today, as Martha said, we focus on Social Security, which has a long history. For example, a limited form of Social Security program began as a measure to implement social insurance during the Great Depression of the 1930s, when poverty rates among senior citizens exceeded 50%. The Social Security Act was enacted August 14, 1935, 88 years ago. The act was drafted during President Franklin Roosevelt's first term by the President's Committee on Economic Security under Francis Perkins and passed by Congress as part of the New Deal. The act was an attempt to limit what we're seeing as dangers in the modern American life, including old age, poverty, unemployment, and the burdens of widows and fatherless children. By signing this act, President Roosevelt became the first president to advocate federal assistance for the elderly. Now I'll ask Melanie Gardner, a member of the Global Senior Steering Committee, to introduce tonight's speaker. Melanie, over to you. Um, welcome, everybody. And uh, we have the privilege of having as our speaker, Nancy J. Altman, <clears throat> who has fifty year a 50-year background in the areas of Social Security and private pensions. She's president of Social Security Works and the chair of Strength and Social Security Coalition. In 2017, Nancy Pelosi appointed Ms. Altman on the <clears throat> Social Security Advisory Board, a bipartisan, independent federal agency established in 1994 to advise the president Congress, and the Commissioner of Social Security. Ms. Altman is the author of Battle for Social Security from FDR's Vision to Bush's Gamble, 
and the truth about Social Security, the founders' <clears throat> words repute revisionist history, zombie lies, and common misunderstandings. She is also co author of Social Security Works Why Social Security Isn't Going Broke and How Expanding It Will Help Us All. She has shared <clears throat> her Social Security expertise on numerous television and radio shows and has published op-eds in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Journal and USA, <clears throat> sorry, and USA Today. <clears throat> she has <clears throat> been on the faculty of Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and taught courses at the Harvard Law School. Ms. Altman chairs the board of directors of the Pension Rights Center and is a member of the board of directors of the Alliance for Retired Americans Educational Fund, Latinas for the, for the Secure Retirement, and the Institute for America's Future. Ms. Altman has been has a B, AB from Harvard University and a JD from University of Pennsylvania Law School. Any questions you have may be taken after Nancy has spoken. And we ask that you use the Q&A feature after Nancy, or, yes, and, and we ask that you use that feature after she's spoken, and we'll give you time to do so. And I have the great pleasure of handing over to Nancy Hall. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, but I'm really delighted to be here talking about a topic that not only is extremely important, it's going to be extremely important, I believe, in the upcoming election. Social Security, as you all know, is, is um, such a successful program. It is most American families' um, most important source of retirement income and often the only source of retirement income. It's the most important life insurance that Americans have, and it's often the only disability insurance that Americans have. Um, as Betsy said, it was created by Franklin Roosevelt um, and signed into law in 1935. He and those, as important as Social Security is, he and the um, and his advisors, Francis Perkins and the others, had a really expanded view of what Social Security is and should be. They saw it as synonymous with basic economic security. So it included, they, they actually worked for universal guaranteed national health insurance. They... Um, wanted um, short-term disability as well as long-term disability. They wanted um, paid sick leave. And continuing that tradition, I think we all are fighting for reducing student debt and all of the other issues that are so necessary to improve um, our, all of our economic security. So the issue has historically been a winning one for the Democrats. In 1982, the midterm election of 1982, Social Security was facing an even larger shortfall than it is today, and it was more immediate. The Democrats ran hard on Social Security, saying that they were there to protect it against cuts, and the Republicans were going to cut it. And some party, the parties do not change their stripes. And um, the Democrats won, I don't know if all of you remember, um, um, Representative Claude Pepper, who was in his 80s at that point and went around virtually to every district. The Democrats won 26 House seats that year um, and restored Social Security long-range balance. The 1990s, it started showing a shortfall once again, which is unsurprising. Social Security is extremely closely managed and, and supervised. And whenever you project out 25, 50, 75 years, you're going to see unexpected shortfalls, unexpected surpluses. But somehow, when this shortfall occurred, the Republicans convinced, or the mainstream media convinced the mainstream media, convinced the Democrats that they um, there were only unpopular solutions. They should all jump, hold hands and jump together. So the 1990s brought a period of calls for a bipartisan balance package and so forth, and really cost the Democrats their, um, their edge. And in addition, um, 
really did not, were not able to um, really extend policy. They were really caught up. Ronald Reagan really set the tone by saying government was the problem. You had to starve the beast and so forth. And all of these important programs were, were really held back. But, but fortunately, the Democrats have rediscovered their roots. They, um, when um, Senator Bernie Sanders ran for president in 2016, he ran on expanding Social Security with no cuts. Um, Secretary Clinton did, really had to join in that, in that call. And the Democrats have really not looked back. The, um, those of you who saw uh, President Biden's State of the Union last year, he simply um, made the honest statement that um, he was going to protect Social Security. There were some Republicans in the chamber who had wanted to cut Social Security, and they had introduced legislation they clearly wanted to cut and put out papers and so forth. But, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene yelled that he was a liar and so forth. It was a sort of a... Um, a uh, memorable moment of the State of the Union. This year in the president's budget, he has called for um, supporting the efforts to expand social security. The Democrats are firmly on board for um, expanding social security without cuts. I know one of the issues and I'll speak about it in a few minutes and happy to talk about it in questions. I know one issue that's of particular concern to um, Democrats abroad is the impact of the so-called technical WEP GPO. The Democrats, President Biden um, advocates um, repealing that as to um, there's a legislation in Congress, the Social Security 2100 Act, um, which was introduced by the then chairman of the Social Security Subcommittee. He's now ranking, but we're all hoping by next January, he will be chairman again. Um, and he has put together a proposal that has a variety of ex um, important expansions. It has an across the board expansion. It calls for a child care, um, a, a, uh, um, a child care credit. It calls for um, better benefits for widow those who are widowed and a whole host disability, getting rid of the five month waiting period, receipt of disability benefits, a number of important targeted increases, including um, repeal of WEP GPO. And that bill has that almost 90% of Democratic members are co-sponsors of that. Another very important bill is the Social Security Expansion Act, um, introduced by Representative Schakowsky in the House and by Senator Sanders and Warren in the Senate. That calls for a very large increase, $200 a month um, increase paid for, as, as does the Sanders bill, paid for requiring the very wealthiest among us, those who were in the case of the, the um, Larson bill, those paying who earned over $400,000, have incomes over $400,000 a month, I mean a year, which is what um, President Biden has called for. The Sanders Warren bill is, has the threshold of $250,000 a month. No one else has to pay a penny. They would pay, those would pay just a, a, the same rate on all their income that minimum wage workers pay on their incomes. Um, and that the Sanders Warren bill restores social security to long range actuarial balance. Um, 75 years, which is a really um, impressive standard and something that um, um, they strive uh, to achieve. The, the actuaries look very closely and seek a valuation period of 75 years, which is much larger. I think Germany's valuation period for its private pensions or for its pensions is something like 25 years. I think the OECD uses 45 years. But the United States social security system, those actuaries use 75 years. And it's really intended to have all contributors 
confident that those benefits will be there for them because they're being so closely monitored. And when there are shortfalls unanticipated, there is plenty of time to act. But that's really been stood on its head. And instead, anytime there's any kind of shortfall decades and decades away, the call is for um, that, oh my gosh, there's a crisis, it's going bankrupt and all of that, which of course, Social Security isn't incapable of doing, it's currently funded. So the, the um, only way that it would pay no benefits at all would be if um, Congress either, no one in the United States worked or, people, or Congress changed the law. In fact, the last time, as I mentioned, I mentioned the 1982 midterm elections. In 1983, um, the Congress enacted the Social Security um, uh, Amendments of 1983, which restored Social Security to long range balance, which meant 75 years. So the next year when the trustees report came out, it showed that Social Security could pay all its um, um, expenses in full, all its benefits in full and on time for the next 75 years, which would have taken us to 2057. The actuaries are now projecting a, a, a modest shortfall that um, will appear in the early 2030s. So what happened? Well, the actuaries are great and they anticipate a lot, but the one thing they did not anticipate was the income and wealth inequality the pair that's so destabilizing that grew in the 1990s that was really um, rivaled the um, inequality of the of the uh, um, right before the Great Depression, and that inequality, that wealth and income inequality, um, according to a th the Economic Policy Institute's calculations, that has cost. Social Security, $1.4 trillion over the last decade. That's $1.4 trillion that stayed in the pockets of the wealthiest Americans rather than go to all of us through Social Security. So what um, President Biden is proposing, what um, so many, um, um, what the Democrats are proposing is to require the 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 Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and all of those wealthy Americans um, contribute their fair share to Social Security. Now, he's running against, as you know, Donald Trump, who before he ran for president um, and claimed that Social Security was a Ponzi scheme, that it should be privatized, that retirement age should be increased, um, because he was not running for office, he could say what he thought. As soon as he started running for office, he decided to uh, separate himself from all the other Republicans and say, hey, they all want to, this was back in 2016, they all want to cut your benefits. And he was accurate about that. But he said, but I'm not me, I'm not going to cut your benefits. Well, lo and behold, as soon as he got into office, every single one of his budgets had, had cuts to Social Security, even though Social Security is self-financed, does not contribute a penny to the deficit. Um, now he's back to saying he's not gonna cut social security, but the mask slipped a little bit. He was on CNBC and he did say that when reelected, he would um, consider cuts to social security. Just a week later, the Republican study committee, which is a, um, a caucus in the um, House of Representatives that all the Republican leadership are members of, and the 80% um, of the Republican caucus are members. They came out with a budget that had deep slashes to Social Security, raises the retirement age to 69, slashes middle-class benefits. Um, it would, it um, um, has serious, um, it eliminates spousal benefits for those with um, earnings of, of income over $85,000, earnings over $85,000. It really is a very, very um, harsh um, 
um, set of proposals that it would really decimate the program. It would change it from an earned benefit related deferred compensation um, related to prior earnings that um, intended to allow people to maintain their standards of living when their wages are lost to a very low subsistence level benefit that is just designed to keep people just above the poverty line. So there's no question the nation is facing a retirement income crisis. Private pensions have largely disappeared. Uh, what we need to do is expand Social Security, not cut it. The um, Democratic um, Party is correct on that. And the, the interesting and important thing is that um, that's where the American people are. The most concerned, the MAGA Republicans do not want to cut Social Security. Rural voters do not want to cut Social Security. Everyone recognizes the value, believes that it's going to be more important than ever, wants to see it expanded, doesn't want to see it cut. One of my um, favorite polls was done in March of 2016 when the uh, presidential primaries were still going strong. So you had Clinton and, um, and Sanders still on, on the Democratic side and on the Republican side, you had Trump and Kasich and Cruz. And the um, Pew Foundation asked voters who they supported and then asked them a range of questions of, of policy questions. And most of the, about you know, foreign policy, all kinds of policy questions. And as you would not be surprised, the, um, the views pretty much stress, uh, spread out and linked to those that they were supporting in every issue but Social Security. With respect to Social Security, all of the voters, including the Cruz voters who wants to privatize Social Security, the Kasich voters who, wants to raise, who wanted to raise the retirement age and so forth, all of those voters, they said they agreed with the, with the policies that they wasn't identified by which party and which candidate, but they were all of the um, views of Senator Bernie Sanders. So that really shows we're, we're, we're on the right side of, of this issue. I, I would guess that all of you feel the way that I do, that this country will not survive if um, Donald Trump becomes president. And I do think um, the, um, you know, there's woman power, the, um, the Dobbs decision was an affront to all of us. And I'm hoping that will have an effect. But in addition, social security is huge. All you need to do, we call older voters always voters because they're gonna vote for you or they're gonna vote against you, they're gonna vote. And the, um, what, what um, it's really important to get the word out that President Biden and the Democrats want to expand social security and want to pay for it by requiring millionaires and billionaires to pay their fair share. Republicans want to cut Social Security so they can give tax breaks to those millionaires and billionaires. And I think that if we can get that message out across the nation and the world, I think that all we need is a few percentage of seniors to change their votes in the um, swing states. And we will then we can retain the White House, retain the Senate, and win the House. And if we do that, I am confident, and we and if Social Security plays a major role, which President Biden, to his credit, is making it a central part, along with lowering drug prices and protecting um, women's bodily autonomy, that he's making that an issue. And I am confident that if um, Democrats win in um, 2024, then we will see legislation um, voted on and, and eventually enacted that expands Social Security and requires the wealthiest to pay their fair share. So with that, I'm happy to take your questions.
Thank you very much for your inspiring words, Nancy. Now for a brief moment, I'd like to ask Jim Dobson, who's the vice chair of the Global Senior Caucus, to give us a few words. Jim, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Betsy. Um, before I get to uh, my uh, topic that I intended to speak on, I do want to uh, reiterate Nancy's point about the importance of getting the message out about Social Security, and particularly if you look at voting demographics. Because uh, in recent elections, age has been a predictor of voting in the sense that the younger have much higher voting percentage for Democratic uh, candidate, and the seniors have a much lower voting percentage relative to the overall population. And if we can get seniors to understand that there's a dramatic difference in what policies are being uh, pro uh, promoted by the two parties, it could, it could change the election. And particularly because we also need to recognize that, that unlike most issues, Social Security is an issue that has such a ripple effect on people's lives. So we really want to get the word out. Now, what I was going to uh, speak about initially uh, was some of the circumstances that uh, seniors living abroad face in accessing their social security. Unfortunately, uh, you don't need to talk to many seniors to get uh, anecdotes about problems that they've encountered. This is partially because of the systems in place, but much more so just because um, there are uh, there are staffing problems, there are technical problems, but the systems, I want to talk about systems that are in place that if they work correctly, will really can really simplify the situation. Now, and first of all, if you, uh, if you need to uh, to reach your so-called local, if you need if you need to interact with a social security office, you, if you're living abroad, you have a so-called local social security office, which is almost certainly not local and may not even be in your in your country of residence. Nonetheless, it is a foreign located. Social Security Office with responsibility for those countries. And you can find that, I'll post this after I speak, you can find a list of those offices uh, at a website, www.ssa.gov slash foreign slash foreign dot HTML. Those are offices that you can call, mail, or drop in on if you're lucky enough to actually live in reasonable proximity. Second thing I want to mention is that there is a procedure for getting your social security benefits paid by direct deposit into a foreign bank account. And this is really important because a lot of seniors living abroad do not have a U.S. bank account. They can't utilize the, the most convenient system or the simplest system. But there's a form, SSA-1199, and I'll also put a link to the page for that, separate form for close to 160 different countries that if you have a bank account in a bank that participates in the international transfer system or international banking system, you can have your uh, your monthly benefits paid without charge uh, through direct wire transfer. You are subject, of course, to the uh, the currency conversion uh, consideration, uh, but it will it does get paid directly, and you don't need anything to yourself to have it converted from dollars to local currency. One other thing uh, that's available. Uh, to, to, at least in some situations, if you don't have a bank account or, you, or it, the bank account is not uh, eligible for the direct deposit, 
uh, the Social Security will pr provide a what's called a Direct Express Master Card. And it's a uh, uh, card in which your monthly benefit is, is deposited to the card or is loaded to the card. And then you may use it as long as there's money on it. You can't use it uh, as a credit card to pay off a, a purchase over time. And you can't use it for any sort of um, uh, uh, overdraft protection, but you can use it as long as you've still got money on the car. In order to get that service, uh, you, you need to contact uh, the U.S. Treasury Electronic uh, Payment Office, which unfortunately can only be contacted uh, by, by telephone. And I'll also put the number for that. I'll give you the number. I'll post that as well, which is 1-877-874-6347. Um, and those, uh, those cards can be used any, any place that you can use a debit card. You can also use an ATM to get a local currency, paying an ATM fee of $3 and a conversion fee of 3%. Uh, so those are the primary uh, primary ways to access your your benefit. I don't know. It looks like we're about the time when we are ready to move on to uh, to uh, the question and answer. Betsy, is that is that the situation? Okay, right. well, I'll go ahead and post these then uh, in the chat box. Thanks very much, Jim, for all the work you do on behalf of the DA seniors. Now we have our own uh, Karen Lee from the Senior Caucus, who will deal with the caucus questions. Over to you, Karen. Thank you, Betsy. So first up from the Youth Caucus, the Youth Caucus, we have the chair, Miguel Madrigal. Miguel? Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's Miguel, chair of the Democrats about Youth Caucus, coming to you live from Costa Rica. Uh, we are so delighted to host you, or at least most of you, at this year's global meeting uh, in late May, early June. So uh, here's my question for you. With the changing demographic and economic landscape, how do you see Social Security evolving to meet the needs of younger generations and what steps can be taken to ensure its sustainability and adequacy for today's youth? Excellent question. Um, Social Security is we're the nation's really facing a retirement income crisis. Social Security is going to be more important to young workers um, than it has been in the past. The um, you know wages have been stagnating. The um, um, private uh, employer plans that define the um, traditional pensions have largely disappeared. The savings plans have, are completely inadequate. They're really a tax giveaway to the very um, wealthy. So, which is part of the motivation of expanding social security, providing additional benefits such as childcare credit in recognition of the important work that those who take time out of the paid workforce um, to care for family members shouldn't be penalized um, for that. I think we also have to tackle student debt. And there's an aspect of that with Social Security. Social Security funds are in, in trust and generally they cannot be seized or garnished um, by creditors. The one exception, which was, and that used to be true for Social Security benefits as well. And it still is for most creditors. They can't go and seize your social security checks. The one place that's not the case, um, and because you might be surprised to hear this, is repaying student loans. That's the one place, the federal loans, that they will go after your social security. And plenty of today's seniors have student loans. Part, sometimes they'll sign for their children or grandchildren. They'll co-sign for a loan. Um, and they, they, it's in arrears and they get, and their social security gets garnished. Sometimes they, for their own educations, still have outstanding loans. But 
we really should, I think, cancel student student debt. And um, but until we do, we certainly should get rid of that where those can be garnished. So I think that the con basic concept of social security is completely modern, modern and really does work for tomorrow's um, seniors uh, as well as today's. And that is that, that as long as we are dependent on wages um, to be meet our basic necessities, we need insurance against the loss of those wages. You can become um, old and you retire and you lose wages for that reason. You can become so disabled that you disabling illness or accident, you get have um, you have disability insurance, you could die leaving your survivors, you have the social security's life insurance. So I don't think that it needs to evolve in the sense that its basic structure, I think, is quite sound. I think the um, those in the New Deal really knew what they were doing. But I do think that um, we need to um, increase the economic security by improving the benefits, and we should pay for that by requiring those who have benefited so well, the, not just the millionaires and billionaires, but multinational corporations that have been so profitable to um, contribute um, to social security so that to the program continue to be self-financing, continue to pay benefits in full and on time, and, um, and um, continue to not add a single penny to the deficit. Thank you. Next, we have Caitlin Kennedy, who's chair of our Progressive Caucus. Caitlin? Hi, thanks so much, Karen. Thank you, Betsy and Jim and the entire Seniors Caucus leadership for hosting this really important event. And of course, Nancy, thank you so much for being with us. Um, we have kind of a two-part question uh, from the Progressive Caucus. Um, the first, um, you've already spoken about the presidential race this cycle, um, but uh, beyond the presidential race, which are the most critical races uh, in 2024 for social uh, supporters of social security protection and expansion to watch and get involved in? Are there any you're really looking at closely? And then the second question, um, which initiatives should we have our eyes on? I know you mentioned several in your comments and how can we best support them from abroad? Excellent questions. The, um, I mean, the most, I think the most important part of this election is retaining the gavels in the in uh, retaking the gavel in the house and retaining it in the senate and we all know the the very close races you know Sherrod Brown is a really strong supporter of social security i would love to see Colin Allred defeat um Ted Cruz i mean there you know there you know there there are all of those we do um Actually, Social Security Works has a PAC. Um, in fact, those of you who are older, you, you younger, um, Caitlin and Miguel, you probably won't know this, but the older ones may remember the um, the, the rock group Shada Na that did the the background um, music for for um, um, for Gre the movie Grease. Um, one of the 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 one with the real bass voice. Um, his name was Bowser, you know, sort of greased back with uh, sleeves rolled up, pretending he was from the 50s, um, is president of our PAC. He's, he, despite the sort of goofiness of um, that, that, that syndicated television show, you can see it on YouTube if you want to see who he is. But he um, really, I think more than anyone else, goes around the country and um, and works with members. His basic line is that he loves the music of the 50s, but he doesn't want to go back to the 50s before Medicare. And he certainly doesn't want to go back to the 30s before Social Security. Um, and we do endorse candidates and who are, who are real champions of Social Security. And there are um, fortunately a growing number, I think, as I say, the Democrats lost their way for a while, but I think they're back talking about lowering drug prices, ex expanding traditional Medicaid, or expanding Social Security. So um, there are, 
I would say that the really the important races are the um, um, the ones where it really matters to to keep um, or take back the gavel where they're really close. In terms of initiatives, um, one thing I did not mention, but is something um, to keep our eyes out for, is that the um, one of the re the Republicans don't like to say what they Republican politicians don't want to say what they really stand for, which is the Marjorie Taylor Greene, even though she's on the Republican study committee that had all kinds of cuts to Social Security, said Biden was lying when he said that. Um, they, for the most part, try to keep their fingerprints off it. And they have been pushing a fast track commission that would report right after the election. So it would be vote, their recommendations would be voted on by um, um, by members who had lost, members who had um, were retiring, and um, the members who were staying there who would be as far away from the next election as they could be. And that's a real danger to Social Security. So far, we've been able to defeat it through, um, um, it's Mike, Mike um, the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, when he took the gavel, said it was his highest priority. It's already been reported out of the budget. So that's that's something to be guarded against. Um, to be um, going forward is, I think, to um, push for a comprehensive, well, actually, let me mention one other thing because it really ties in a little bit to what Jim was talking about too. And that is that even though the social security, the the um, the the cost to um, administer social security comes out of the same dedicated trust funds as the benefits, so doesn't as prepaid as doesn't add to the deficit. There's a limit on how much that can be spent. It's called a limitation on administrative expenses. The Republicans have really starved the agency um, for decades as the number of beneficiaries has really skyrocketed, which is why service has really deteriorated. It's really, I think, a strategy of death by a thousand cuts of to try to really, they can't undermine confidence in the support for the program, but if you can't access your benefits, and I'm hearing, so a lot of the issues you're talking about are new to me, but in terms of how hard it is for all of you abroad to get the information and the access that you need, you might, not be surprised to know it's very hard now, getting increasingly hard for America, for those living in the United States because of um, long wait times and long times on hold and so forth. So urging Congress to um, appropriate, to allow Social Security to spend more of its money on administration to expand the benefits and fighting against um, the, uh, so-called fast track commission, I think are all um, issues to be aware of and involved with. Okay, that's uh, some really good points here. I'd like to expand on them. However, <laughs> I have Marcy, Marnie Delaney, who's chair of our disability caucus and Marnie has questions now. Marnie, go. I do, well, I have, I have um, um, first of all, I have a huge desire to just download everything in your brain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but um, I think uh, I'm going to take a second and just encourage everybody to send the, the the video of this when it's done, the recording of this, to everybody they know, um, especially the the folks in the, that older category that perhaps haven't been voting properly lately. Um, my question actually sort of builds on what you were just saying because I think administrative burdens for people with disabilities are uh, they're just a horrible situation. I mean, the, from from the excessive paperwork that goes on year after year after year at two, um, to having to go to meetings in, in difficult to get to places at difficult to deal with times. Um, uh, wonder, and that's true for various reasons for different, for all sorts of groups that have a, typically have a difficult time with pretty much everything. Um, so I wonder if you can just reflect on, on what can be done, and maybe the administrative things that you were talking about have something to do with this, but what can be done to remedy this situation and bring us up to a, a, be a better ability to deal with the system? 
Excellent question. And I think the, um, and you really spotlight something that, that really is of great concern. I was um, sort of a, a amazed that you mentioned in the introduction that I'm on the Social Security Advisory Board. And we had um, a meeting about the very issues you're just talking about. And one of the um, people who came to speak to us was um, a woman who um, had been, was a lawyer, had been um, active law practice and then had um, a disabling illness and applied for disability benefits. And she told us that even though she was a lawyer, English was her native language and all of that, she needed a lawyer to be able to get through the, um, um, the process. It was so burdensome. And so you can just imagine, uh, and, you know, people who have mental um, disabilities, people who, um, where English is not their native language, people who do not, you know, don't have a high school um, diploma. I mean, it, you know, that, that there are so many obstacles and burdens and some of them um, are, are there with any bureaucracy. But I think with social security, and this is another way that I think there's been an effort to undermine it, is that, and again, it's largely Republicans who assume everybody is a fraudster and that, you know, people, I mean, the reality is that most people want to work and there, there are numerous numbers of people who should be getting benefits, but I'm just are reluctant to apply. They're still trying to, to survive without benefits because the benefits themselves have been demonized because of all the reports about all the fraud where, where there's vanishingly little of that. Um, and the way to correct the fraud is to hire, hire more workers so that, because they're the front line of detection. But in any event, part of what has to happen is simplification of these programs that they, um, the, you know, the, the, um, there are, there, you have to jump through so many hoops and have these um, disability continuing reviews, which are, I've talked to people um, who've gone through them, they're incredibly <laughs> stressful. Um, they are hard to get lawyers to do because there's no, you know, there's no pay for the lawyers. So they often have to face it alone. And they're, they're being faced with losing their benefits if they somehow don't respond to a form in time. I mean, it's really terrible. So what we need is a really compassionate um, um, public servants. And we do for the most part, and it's social security really attracts people who, who are um, public minded and really want to serve to give the agency the money that's needed, but also to elect a Congress that will simplify the law and reduce the administrative burdens. The, to Biden's credit, he does have a, 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 um, um, a, 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 an agenda going forward to um, try to um, um, reduce undue burdens across the government and including the social security. But there's much more that can and should be done. It is a really serious problem and one that's a really kind of outrageous. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and there's one more question prepared and that's from us, from the Seniors Caucus. Um, this is kind of a recap because you have touched on it, but we see over and over again, political commentators predict there won't be enough money in the government's coffers to fund social security in the second half of this century too bad. Um, Nancy, is it true? Tell us it's not true. <laughs> well, the the reality is that, as I, get, as I mentioned, it's been really stood on its head. Starting in 19, for benefits were first paid in 1940. Starting in 1941, there are about 40 actuaries at the Social Security Administration, because it's basically an insurance um, company. This is an insurance program. That, and they've got actuaries who are very closely monitoring the income and outgo of the program, the same way private insurers do. And there have been, has been 
um, a projected shortfall. It's quite manageable. It's, um, um, but Congress does have to act. I am 100% confident Congress is gonna act. If Congress were not to act, the you know benefits wouldn't stop, but they'd be reduced automatically across the board. That's the way the law works. But every member would not only be voted out of office, I think they'd be run out of the town. I think they would not be able to see anyone. So there's no question they're going to act. The question is, what do they do when they act? The Republicans have proposals out that literally would um, decimate middle class benefits, would really transform the program away from um, deferred compensation and earned benefit um, to just this subsistence level benefit that would be completely inadequate. And the Democrats want to require those earning with incomes over $400,000 to, to pay more. And there's no question that social security is completely affordable. It, um, the only question, and, and what we do about it, whether we expand benefits or cut benefits is a, solely a question of values. And as I said in my remarks, the, the American people are united. So as long as we get the politicians not to go behind closed doors or a commission or some way, and really, and the election is the right time. Every candidate should be saying whether they're going to expand benefits or cut benefits and whether they're going to allow a vote, whether they'll do it in the sunshine. Um, so there, there, there is a um, projected shortfall. It's unsurprising. Uh, it happens with every plan, you know, it's, it's um, in every country, but it, it is not something to um, be alarmed about. It's something actually to give you reassurance that it's being very closely monitored. So benefits will always be there for us. That's the answer I wanted to hear. And I also love your, your framing of it as deferred benefits. I think we forget that and, and the Republicans treat it as something they're giving to us out of their yeah. pockets, charity. Yeah, yeah well, which is okay. You know, to what, what they're trying to do is reach into our pockets because yeah. it's hard money. <laughs> money went into the wrong pocket. Okay, <laughs> Nancy, thank you so much. And now it's back to Betsy and Jim, and they've got some questions for you from the Q&A box. Right. Thanks very much, Nancy and Karen. Uh, the first question is from Carmelin Holst from Sydney, Australia. And she says, we have heard of cases of retirees abroad having their social security benefits suspended because their proof of life form has not been received by the social security administration. In the cases I know of, the beneficiary has mailed the form from abroad using a self-addressed return envelope pre-addressed to the Social Security Administration office in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. The form was not received. The beneficiary stopped receiving benefits. They called the Social Security Administration and were told to file the form with a local embassy or consulate in their country of residence. The beneficiary has done so. The suspension was lifted, benefits resumed, and back benefits were paid. It seems that a clarification of procedure could be helpful. Is this something that could be looked into by Social Security Works? Could your organization work with the Social Security Administration to clarify this process for Americans living abroad going forward on their website and with U.S. embassies and consulate offices. Absolutely, and I don't, I don't, I know whether this will make um, you all feel better or worse. But this, that is, a, that is one example of all kinds of things that are happening with all kinds of forms that are being sent in multiple times or being faxed and being lost. And the reason is that the agency is being starved. It's got, extra, you know, it's got. Um, its lowest staffing in about 25 years at a time when it's um, the number of seniors is just when its beneficiary has gone up 20, I think funding has been cut 17% while um, the, the workload has gone up 22%. And it's just untenable. And what happens is it's a vicious 
circle because it is a cycle because um, there's it's a very hard job. It's not well compensated. It can be very frustrating to people. They're at their wits end and they have to wait long time and so forth. So, and you can make um, often make more money in the private sector with a less stressful job. And so the agency, which used to be the best place in the government to work, according to surveys, now ranks as the worst place among the large agencies to work, every survey shows. There's a very high attrition rate, so it's getting worse. And the real answer, I mean, we can look into the um, to the particular, because that's, that's a new one to me, but not surprising, because it is um, something that's happening because of the lack of staffing and the last of, lack of funding, and that is really up to Congress. And that's why this election is so important for that kind of issue as well. There's only so much the, the um, agency can do when they're, they're understaffed. Thanks, Nancy. It looks like that uh, people can't uh, vote on these questions. So I think we're going to have to go in order. Jim, you want to do the next question? Well, let me, uh, there's a question that follows up in a way, on what uh, on what Nancy was just talking about, there's uh, one of our uh, one of our listeners has is from South Africa, where the postal system is totally unreliable, and has been unsuccessful in getting that uh, in rec even receiving the form. Mm. And, and his question was about the uh, my Social Security account. And whether that couldn't be the mechanism where the, the the request could be provided to the beneficiary and the response could be transmitted back. What's what's the situation on, on using that account? Well, let me put it in a broader context and then talk specifically about that account. The Social Security Administration used to be on the cutting edge of um, of technology, you know, it's it's such a large um, agency position. You know, trillions of dollars going through um, sixty-seven million beneficiaries and so forth. That it was always on the cutting edge. But again, um, as the um, you know Reagan Revolution, all of that, there started being the agency started being being um, starved. And if you can imagine. They are still using green screens. They are still, I mean, they are, they, you know, I, I think it may be changing now, but they didn't even have laptops in some of the district offices and so forth when they, and there has been, an, and I give Congress credit for this, they have finally, um, a few years ago, provided additional funding to upgrade the, um, to modernize the technology. Um, and that is an ongoing process and they are trying to put more and more online and, and trying to get more people to use my social security. I've actually myself find my social security kind of confusing and difficult, but um but I, I I'm not very technologically uh um adept so so it may be easier for others. But the but that is only a part of the solution. And for those of you abroad and if if you you know the, the mail is hard Absolutely, and for those who are able to use it, um, doing contacting the agency online, more and more um, there is an effort to do more and more of that, and to um, for all kinds of reasons. And I think that's very valuable. But we have to remember that there are plenty of people who don't have broadband. There are plenty of people who don't have access to computers. They may have a smartphone, or they, but that may be not um, able to um, stable enough and so forth. And that this there's the field offices being able to call the 800 number. I think that what you know, the United States should have and all Americans should have is a choice of how you want to approach the agency. So much more should be done to update um, the technology and the internet and allow more work to be done online, more the, they're you know, more able to apply online and so forth. Um, 
But I think we're always going to have to fund and should fund the field offices. In fact, just one last thing before um, we go and I conclude on this point. I was, you know, a lot of people have this idea, oh, it's a problem of old people. You know, once all the old people are gone, all these technologically advanced kids will be able to, you know, do everything. We got had very interesting polling, and that is that younger people, they're more um, um, technologically sophisticated, which means they also know more about scammers and hacking and all of that. And when they were, and actually they were the group that most wanted to deal with the Social Security Administration in person and not put in a lot of information online. And, and um, so I think this is something that, um, again, people should have the most, um, we've, we've paid for these benefits and we've paid for the administration of them and we should have, be able to walk into field offices without long waits be able to call the 800 number and be able to be answered within a minute or two and be able to conduct the work that needs to be conducted online. And we're heading there, but it's gonna take uh, the right administration and uh, the right Congress to fund that. Thanks very much, Nancy. Uh, we have a question here. It's quite a short question from Peter Ryder. In your view, should the retirement age be raised? Oh, no. <laughs> In fact, it's, you know, it's, first of all, two points about it. The, although it's not very well understood even by a lot of experts, the, the way that the Social Security formula is, um, benefits are calculated, raising the retirement age is indistinguishable from an automatic across the board Cut. So even if you work till 70, you never catch up. But of course, it's a particular hardship um, for those of um, who are in physically demanding jobs and really don't have no choice but to leave the workforce. And then they just have much lower benefits. Um, but the reason, I mean, first of all, I don't think benefits should be cut. So that's one reason I definitely don't think the retirement age should be increased. But the other is that it's been a sign of progress to limit work and to, you know, people can work as long as they want, but to have leisure. So we, are we do we want to go back to the um, six or seven hour, six day work week? Do we want to go back to 10 hour work days? Do we want to go back to, to child labor? I mean, we should be, you know, again, we should enforce age discrimination laws and people who want to work longer should be um, uh, not precluded from doing that. But those who don't should not be forced to because they can't, you know, we talk about, we don't want people to have to work till they die. And um, raise, the, raise the retirement age has already been raised to 67. My feeling is that we should be lowering the retirement age, not raising. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, now a question uh, from uh, Lena Rosen. What countries are reducing Social Security and what countries are, are increasing Social Security? Well, and this is probably one you all know better than I do because my focus does tend to be more on the um, American system. But I was really interested and we actually met with um, um, some people from the French parliament that, uh, you know, I was... I was actually thrilled to be in the United States watching the protests um, in France when there were efforts to lower, to increase the retirement age um, there. And I think that, um, you know, we do have, I mean, here's actually another point too. I mean, a lot of countries have aging populations and it's as the United States does. And it, it um, is, um, but there is a solution to um, aging populations and easing the burden, and that is to open your doors to immigration. I mean, the the um, um, the actuaries have shown that that um, immigrants to the United States bring in billion, contribute billions and billions of dollars to Social Security every year. They tend to be younger. They buy, often by 
um, by culture, they have larger families. So they're, they're um, really stimulating the economy and, and um, providing a lot of economic growth. And, um, you know, ironically, I mean, politicians will never say this, but it's true that those um, who are undocumented in the United States are often contributing the most because they are often paying on um, on uh, false social security numbers um, and not claiming benefits, so they're contributing. But outrageously, even when they become legal, and even when I shouldn't say legal, even when they become documented, and even when um, they can prove that those contributions were ones they had made. Congress has said they still don't get those benefits and they should. Um, we need to do, you know, that's a whole other topic, immigration, but it fits with social security. It's a um, um, one way, one way to, um, we talked before about the uh, shortfall that social security's um, facing and we're talking about taxing millionaires and billionaires. Well, another thing we could do is um, um, have more open our doors to uh, more immigration. Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, we have a question here about Medicare. Is there a push to get access to access Medicare from abroad too? Uh, do you know about that at all? Anything to do with? Uh, Medicare. There's, we do have in, in Democrats Abroad the Medicare Portability uh, Task Force where we're actually negotiating uh, to have the possibility to do a uh, small study where there could be uh, possibilities opened up. First of all, sort of again in broader context, um, all of you should know and, and all voters should know that Medicare, just like Social Security, I mean, some people think of it as, you know, it's part of the Social Security Act, that, um, and, and actually is a, a little digression, but the interesting point of history that, as I mentioned, Franklin Roosevelt wanted guaranteed universal health insurance. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he had succeeded in that? Trump, I mean, Truman tried to get it. And then Medicare was a fallback position. It was incremental. It was supposed to be the first step towards Medicare for all, but and we got uh, Medicare for seniors in 1965. It was extended to people with disabilities in 1972, and that's where it stopped. So we should be expanding Medicare. I, I, um, but it is under threat the same way it's under attack. The Republican Study Committee, what I mentioned, is trying to privatize Social Security. Medicare Advantage has a lot of bad actors and bad users that is um, really privatizing, a, a step towards privatizing so Medicare. So all of us may lose Medicare, not just um, those living abroad. But I do think that, um, that they go together, that if we can expand, you know, again, it's, uh, um, it's always interesting to me when I've gone abroad and if I've had some kind of illness or something, that you know, there's you, you just get you get the treatment and you pay whatever it is. It's a marginal kind of cost in the United States, even for um, people. Medicare is quite good, but if you have other private health insurance, um, you you you're denied the care. You have limited access and so forth. So again, I don't know as much as I should about um, the those of you living abroad, but. Um, it should be, it's again, it's an earned benefit. You've contributed to it um, and it should be available. And I don't know what all the issues are about the, the different medical systems and, and whether, because again, it's, it's not just cash benefits, social security, you can get anywhere, but Medicare is dependent on getting medical care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I have a question uh, from Mary Stewart Berger. Uh, to spread the message about Social Security and, and the political aspects or the, uh, the differences between the two parties, do you have any links or uh, resources 
that you would, can recommend off the top of your head? Oh, we have a lot. If you, and I, I don't want to do this as a, a plug, but if you go to social security works, all one word, dot org, um, we have a lot of polling. We have a lot of, um, you know, we, we respond. In fact, if you sign up, we send out, you, you know, there'll be funding requests, but you don't have to contribute, but it just, um, there's, we are following this every minute and there, you get a lot of attention and a lot of information. But on our website, and you know, I, I write regular columns and so forth. Um, that I think, um, and in fact, actually, the Biden administration has been very good with their messaging, with their ads, and their. Um, so there is a lot of good information out there, um, and um, I think we've got quite a bit on our website that that um, you all might find interesting. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, this question comes from Bruce Murray. How can we engage with friends, families, and community members best to encourage better understanding of the difference between Republican and Democratic approaches to Social Security? You know, this is, is a hard one because we are so polarized and we're getting our news from different um, places so that a lot of people just, I mean, uh, um, you know, I worked um, in, you know, for a Republican senator when I was in my 20s. I was Alan Greenspan's assistant on the National Commission on Social Security Reform that led to the 83 amendments. And um, the, but the, but today the Republican Party is really radicalized and it's really anti. Social Security, but it's very hard to get that message through. Some of what can be done, some like Nikki Haley was quite clear about she wanted to raise the retirement age. And so some, um, but she's she also did not get the nomination. So the, the Republicans are very kind of careful. Um, I think, well, let me say something else. I think Prior to um, the 2022 election, I think part of the reason there wasn't that red wave, some of it was Dobbs, but I also think it was because the Republicans were sort of couldn't hold themselves back and were talking about um, sunsetting Social Security or they were talking about um, making the program discretionary and holding the debt limit hostage and all that kind of thing. So I think seniors saw it and they, um, and they, they um, voted accordingly. This time you do have Trump who's sort of all over the place. And, and But I think if, if they look at the, if you can really get them to see that he proposed cuts, that's in the media, but he proposed cuts. I mean, you can see his budgets, they're online. Um, that um, And his prior statements about social security and certainly the Republican study committee's proposals and this, fight to try to get this fiscal commission. I think the way, I think the good news is that the um, the most conservative Republicans agree with all of us on this Zoom event. They do, poll after poll shows that they do not want to see benefits cut. They want to see them expanded. They think the program is more important than ever. And that's by like 80%, 85%, I mean, huge margins. So this isn't close, but they've bought a lot of the propaganda that it's not going to be there for them, um, which is just a way to undermine confidence. And unfortunately, I'm afraid they believe the Republicans, Donald Trump and the others, when they say, oh, don't you can trust us. We're not going to. And the problem is we can't trust. They will. They, I mean, it's very clear for those of us who follow the issue closely to see. So I think it's very important to talk to people about it, um, but I don't know what you can say if you've got a relative or a friend who's just determined to not believe it. Hey, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions uh, of the same sort saying, asking about the situation where the person is receiving social security benefits and receiving either a governmental or a private pension uh, 
far, from a foreign source. Yes. Yes. So, and I um, had meant to um, address that in my, my um, direct remarks, so I'm glad the question is here. The so-called WEP GPO is something that um, um, is often a shock and a surprise, and it, it really it, it, um, is something that the, um, should be repealed. The good news is that President Biden has proposed repealing it, and a large number of members of the House have proposed it. My guess is it will be part of an expansion bill um, that has the very wealthy pay for them. And this is one expansion that should should go in. It's um, um, so that it's, I say, is there a website for FGPO? There are, um, I know that there, because I've um, um, met with them, they're very um, active lobbyists on this issue. I don't, I don't offhand know the link, but I'm sure if you Google it, it's easy to find. But um, it is, there is a very active presence. There are actually uh, timely, just yesterday, um, the Ways and Means Committee in the House um, announced that they're having a hearing on um, Web GPO um, next Tuesday. But all of you, I urge you to be very, both skeptical and careful because what I'm seeing Republicans do is to um, talk about WEP GPO. Maybe they'd even, they'll even vote um, to repeal it, but their other cuts will leave all of those, all of you who are affected by WEP GPO and all of you who are not affected by WEP GPO much worse off. You, it's a kind of, you equalize up so you, bring those who have their benefits reduced by web GPO, do you repeal it? And then you bring them up so they get ex the expanded benefits we're fighting for, for everyone? Or do you equalize down so that, okay, there's no web GPO, but the bad news is you're worse off than you were when you were subject to web GPO. And I've been doing the numbers and that the Republican study committee proposals, which is what's gonna happen if the um, commission is um, it goes through will literally leave. They don't call for repealing wet GPO, but even if they did, they would leave um, um, people with lower benefits when the smoke cleared. It would be a pyrrhic victory, which of course is no victory at all. I have one question, the status of the trust fund, what's the status of the trust fund and what will be involved in getting it repaid to social security? Good, oh, good question. The, the, um, in fact, very timely because the new trustees report will be coming out probably in a few weeks. Um, Social Security currently has, it has two trust funds, one, um, and they should be combined, but they aren't. There's the old age survivors insurance trust fund, disability insurance trust fund. They're often seen on a, on a combined basis. On a combined basis, they have 2.8 they have a $2.8 trillion reserve. That's a $2.8 trillion accumulated surplus. Now, people are not used to thinking of the United States as having big governmental surpluses, but it does in the case of um, Social Security. It is um, because Congress has not yet acted to um, bring in more revenue, it is being drawn down. So. And let me be clear about this because there's a lot of misinformation about the trust funds. Um, Social Security is a creditor of the United States that it, it um, has dedicated revenue that can only be used. And those are the contributions that are um, deducted from people's paychecks, you know, the old Federal Insurance Contribution Act payments matched dollar for dollar by employers. That is one source of Social Security's revenue. Um, but when that revenue exceeds its expenses, money is not just put under a mattress, it's invested. And from the very beginning, Congress has required the um, people's pension to
to be invested in the safest investment on earth, which is U.S. treasuries backed by the full faith and credit of the United States. I mean, everyone, as you know, all over the world invests in U.S. treasuries and Social Security um, is no different. In fact, if um, the social, if they ever did not, if the government, you know, and whenever you are a creditor, you purchase a bond, you hope that the one you're, um, you're um, buying the, lending the bond to will, or um, lending the money to, will use it responsibly and for growth. And, but whether they do or not, they have to pay it back with interest. Social Security's um, bonds are at the, at the same, they have the same legal status as every other bond that's issued, whether it's to the Chinese government or to a private um, account or some grandparent buys it for a grandchild, they, they have the same legal status. It would be a default if, social, if they were, um, um, didn't, weren't paid back. The good news is that they do pay it back. As they say, there are about 40 actuaries at the Social Security Administration. There are a number of people at the Treasury Department, and they're talking every day about purchasing these bonds and the interest rates. And you can go to the trustees report and see the par values and the interest rates and so forth. It's all fair market. They're very, very careful about it. So the, the money is extremely secure and safe. But again, you have a caution. And that is the part of what the Republicans want to do with these and I should say conservatives, but it's that these days it's um, Republicans that want to cut benefits so much that the, the funds won't be needed. And of course, they talk about a balanced budget amendment, even though Social Security doesn't add to the budget. And that would completely have those trust fund monies disappear. And those are, those are funds, you know, I sort of joke that people talk about trust fund babies. Well, all of you on this call who are getting social security are a trust fund baby because you've got a a um, a trust that has two point eight trillion dollar reserve in it. Okay, thank you so much, Nancy. We're going to stop here because we're running out of time, and we have one more uh, speaker to speak. Thank you so much, Nancy, for taking the time to be with us this morning, and thank you so much for answering. Uh, questions for us. We're very grateful to you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much for having me. Okay. Uh, we have our uh, Lauren Hakulinen is going to talk to us about the Senior Caucus. Lauren? Yeah, helps to unmute. Um, just to wrap things up, each month we have a social chat with the Disabilities Caucus held on the last Friday of each month. This month it will be in uh, uh, April 20th. If you're not already a Seniors Caucus member, you can join today to automatically receive something that was in the way to automatically receive our monthly newsletter that includes updates on voting, event reminders, and news affecting seniors. Our newsletters can be found on our website, and um, Jim is putting those links in the chat as we speak. Right, Jim? <laughs> New overseas voters find us on social media like Facebook and on X, formerly Twitter, and others. So it's important to have an active page on both sides. That's why we do it. We ask you to help us find more voters by following, liking, and sharing our posts. And Jim's putting those links in the chat right now. We hope you can contact our seniors and your representative today to help support the elimination of WEP, the windfall elimination provision. And you can find that link in the chat. And if you haven't already, please read the Taxation Tax Force report, which is important for all seniors. And that wraps it up. Thank you for all, all for attending. We hope to see you at our next event. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Uh, we'll see you in the future. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thanks very much.